Um, it also presents this first real debunking of morality, this first real critique of morality. Um, and this kind of a critique of morality, this kind of criticism of morality, follows from his metaphysical, or really his anti-metaphysical picture. Um, because if you think, like Kant, that in order to be binding, morality must be part of the world itself, not the world of experience, not the empirical world. But if you conclude that there is no world in itself, there is no thing in itself, there is no true world behind the empirical world, then you're going to conclude that morality is false. So if you stick with a kind of Kantian picture of morality, that it can't be based on empirical knowledge, but you conclude that there's only empirical knowledge, that there's no intellectual world, that there's no thing in itself, then you're going to be forced to reject the possibility of morality. Um, and in fact, this is pretty much what Nietzsche thinks at this stage. And he held that basically some form of um, uh, some form of psychological egoism is true. We can only act on the basis of our empirical desires because there are only empirical desires. Um, and therefore, um, there are no, put it this way, in Kant's language, there are no actions that are from duty. There are no actions that are not based on some empirical incentive. And therefore, morality is false in the sense that um, there are no moral actions. Human beings, it's impossible for human beings to act that way. Um, in the next two years, he published um, <coughs> two other essays that eventually became incorporated into uh, Human All Too Human. By 1879, his health had deteriorated further. He had, as I mentioned this before, he had blinding migraines, which lasted days at a time. He had uncontrollable vomiting. And after taking several leaves of absence from the university, he eventually just retired. And for the rest of his life, he lived on a very small pension that he received from the university. His next work, uh, in many ways, was the first of his mature works called Daybreak. Sometimes this is translated as Dawn. Um, and the subtitle is Thoughts on Moral Prejudices. It was published in 1881, continued the aphoristic mode, um, and completely sealed his alienation from the academic community and actually from most of his friends as well. Because here, Christianity comes under the gun much more directly. So rejecting metaphysics, rejecting the existence of any deep truths of things in themselves beyond the ordinary world of science and experience, here he rejects Christian metaphysics in particular. Um, and the essential Christian elements of morality, of Christian morality. So here he's rejecting the ideas of God and sin and free will and the afterlife. These are unscientific, they are non-empirical, and so have to be rejected. And furthermore, he thinks that uh, Christianity um, deprecates, uh, reduces human experience, our empirical observations and existence in the world, by convincing believers of their own sinfulness and convincing them of 
worthiness for eternal damnation. And this is the idea of original sin uh, that generates guilt among all believers, leads them to basically hate their bodies, leads Christians to hate their empirical, material existence uh, in favor of the true world uh, beyond this life. But as, so that's a, the result, uh, but as a, a matter of fact, the way the psychology of Christianity works, uh, the way the psychology of Christianity works, according to Nietzsche, is that um, this sort of self-loathing and guilt that Christians feel leads them to look to find other people who are more sinful than they are. So despite the official doctrine of loving thy neighbor, the way the psychology of Christianity works is that it encourages them to despise their existence in this world. Remember for Nietzsche, this is the only world that there is, the empirical, ordinary, mundane world in favor of imagining a false and illusory one. Um, and finally, Christianity preaches the, um, the escape from this world into an afterlife. Um, rather, than you, rather than recognizing that this is the only world that there is, and trying to use our existence in this world to create things of value, rather than escape into a world in the afterlife. Okay, we're of course interested especially in his assessment of morality, and his, although he continues to criticize morality, he continues to describe himself as an immoralist, his uh, attack on morality undergoes a very important shift here. Um, and so here I want to read another passage. So this is um, the bottom of the second page here. So here he's continuing to reject morality, but on, not one, on crucially different grounds from what he did. So before it was this metaphysical view or anti-metaphysical view that says that um, there can't be anything, there can't actually be actions that would properly be described as moral because there's no deep metaphysical existence beyond the empirical world. That's what would have to be uh, the case in order for an action to truly be moral. But now there's a different view. Um, instead of rejecting the possibility of a truly moral act, now he's questioning the value of a truly moral act. So let me say that again. Uh, in an earlier work, when he was rejecting morality, he was rejecting it sort of on metaphysical grounds that there could not actually be actions which would properly be described as moral. Now he's not doubting that. Rather, now he's doubting whether they are good, whether those actions actually are valuable. This is what he says at the bottom of one, sorry, at the bottom of the second page, this is the daybreak section 103. He says there are two kinds of deniers of morality. That's the title of the section. He says to deny morality. This can mean two things. First, to deny that the moral motives which men claim have inspired their actions, really have done so. So when, when people claim that they're acting from duty, maybe we want to say, no, they're not. There are actually empirical incentives there. So their actions are actually there. That's one way to deny morality. This first way is thus the assertion that morality consists of words and is among the coarser or more subtle deceptions, especially self-deceptions, which we practice, and is perhaps so especially in precisely, the, in precisely the case of the most famed for virtue. So you should be especially suspicious of people who claim that they are acting from duty. They're probably deceiving themselves, and there's an empirical inclination there. But 
there's another way of denying morality. Then he says it could mean to deny that moral judgments are based on truth. Here it is admitted that they really are motives to action. People really can act from duty. But that in this way, it is errors which, as the basis of all moral judgment, impel men to their moral actions. This is my point. Though I should be the last to deny that in very many cases there are some ground for suspicion that the other point of view may also be justified, and in any event, of great general application. So, in fact, he thinks people often do have uh, coarser motives. It's not just done from duty. Um, but it's the second point that he wants to emphasize. Thus, I deny morality as I deny alchemy. That is, I deny their premises. But I do not deny that there have been alchemists who believed in these premises and acted in accordance with them. I also deny immorality. Not that countless people feel themselves to be immoral, but that there is any true reason so to feel. And now here, it goes without saying that I do not deny, unless I'm a fool, that many actions called immoral ought to be avoided and resisted or that many called moral ought to be done and encouraged. But I think one should be encouraged and the other avoided for reasons, for other reasons than hitherto. We have to learn to think differently in order at last, perhaps, very late on, to attain even more to feel differently. Okay, so instead of doubting whether there are any moral actions, now we question whether moral actions are actually good whether there are good reasons to do that, whether these, the value of moral actions are as high as defenders of morality say. But second, notice he's not simply in favor of immorality. People feel that they act immorally all the time. He's not denying that. Um, but whether all immoral actions should count as bad. All actions that are counted as immoral are bad. Right. Um, and most importantly of all, um, he's not denying that, he, that we can make evaluations. He's not embracing nihilism. So the claim here is that the concepts of morality and immorality don't pick out the good and bad actions that the evaluations in terms of moral concepts are mistaken. That sometimes the moral actions are in fact good, sometimes the immoral actions are in fact bad, but we need to better understand what makes them good, what makes them bad. It's not the categories of morality. Okay, so we'll pick up with that next time. Um, you should read the... Um, Preface on Wednesday, and I'll finish the.